Okay, we'll be starting in about one minute. All right. Good morning, everybody. We're here at the shores of uh, Lady Bird Lake and pulling Greg away from a good bout of fishing this morning. Um, actually not. We're in our uh, hidden studio bunker here in uh, Austin, Texas, and we'd like to welcome everybody to today's session of Greg's Live Process Control Seminar and Demo Series. We call these Deminars for short. Today's topic is PID control of runaway processes. The broadcast is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. Uh, we'll be muting all but Greg's microphone, so please use the Q&A box to ask your questions of Greg, and I'll relay them verbally to him during the course of today's seminar session. And we'd like this to be as interactive as possible, so feel free to ask your questions as they occur, and I'll relay them on to Greg. With that, let me turn it over to Greg. Okay, thank you, Jim. Well, uh, these seminars are sponsored by Emerson and Experitech, a local business partner in Minus Simulation Technologies. They're created by me and Jack Ehlers, who is a, a process control specialist at Monsanto. And the website was created by uh, Charlie uh, Schleiser at CS Design Co. in St. Louis. Uh, this is me. Uh, you know me by now. Uh, and. Uh, I've got a top ten list here, courtesy of uh, Mike Brown. Uh, we've been doing a three-part series in uh, Control Talk, and uh, part three in September 2010 has a pretty good uh, top ten list. I worked with Mike uh, back in the 1990s on model predictive control, and so um, here is uh, uh, his list uh, that uh, concludes our control talk series with him. It's the top ten control room key performance indicators that will not lead to process improvement and should not be reported. Uh, number ten, uh, the number of coffee cups consumed on a night shift. Nine, number of chairs broken by our favorite lead operator, Big Bob Gibson. Eight, average length of time an operator can keep his eyes closed before falling asleep. Seven, shortest recorded time for operator handover at a shift change. Six, uh, longest recorded time to bring up a DCS graphic following a control system upgrade. Five, the number of times the operator gets the DCS alarm, NPC error. Please reinvert the matrix. Four, number of process control engineers that cannot process engineers. I cannot spell PID. Three, number of instrument tuning technicians with the last name Ziegler Nichols. And number two, number of times an operator shouts bingo. And the number one KPI not to be reported. Any KPI that needs to be charted with a control range of a minus 1,000 to a plus 1,000 percent. Well, in what we're going to be talking about mostly today is uh, exothermic reactors uh, because they're most important and difficult examples um, of, uh, of runaway processes. And they're used to produce uh, polymers and special chemicals, uh, specialty chemicals. Uh, the key thing is they're runaways because the reaction rate exponentially increases with temperature. Um, the uh, tight temperature control is important for batch cycle time, production rate, and product quality, uh, reaction rate maximization, and off-spec uh, production minimization depends on operating at the 
maximum temperature that does not trigger side reactions of uh, off-grade or undesirable products. Tight temperature control is important for safety. A point of no return can be reached uh, where reaction heat release is greater than heat removal causing a high temperature or high pressure trip. Temperature control is extremely sensitive to thermal lags in heat transfer surfaces and in thermal wells. And we'll see that today. You have to be awfully careful. You may not be able to control and it may in fact run away from you if there are um, what might be normally considered insignificant uh, thermal lags due to fouling of the heat transfer surfaces or fouling or improper design of the uh, thermal wells. Open loop uh, tests are deceptive and potentially a safety issue since uh, the response looks like an integrator until the acceleration kicks in. Controller tuning settings required are unusual. Conventional rule, tuning rules can cause slow oscillations, overshoot, and potentially a trip of the safety instrument system, the SIS. There are other examples of runaway processes, uh, but we don't uh, view them uh, as being uh, that common or that difficult. Uh, one of them is the biological reactors in the exponential growth phase that can have a runaway response for cell concentration control. But the time constant is so slow it often does not present a control problem. And also we're not doing that many uh, examples of cell con closed loop cell concentration control. Uh, strong acid and strong base control systems can exhibit a near runaway response for excursions towards the neutral point due to extreme nonlinearities. Orders of magnitude increase in uh, titration curve or slope in the approach to 7 pH causes an acceleration that can look like a runaway to the BID controller. Who only knows what it says. An ax uh, I personally had experience with an axial compressor speed control system uh, that uh, can exhibit a severe, extremely fast runaway response during surge due to unloading. Even though um, supposedly this doesn't happen, it did happen big time, and I suspect it does happen in another case. But for this situation, within a second or two, we could get into trouble. So we installed a speed derivative unit that tripped the compressor on high acceleration, uh, preventing uh, ro rotor damage from excessive vibration and the benefits were over a million dollars a year in savings and eliminating damaged rotors and the need to stop multiple rotors. It was a very unique, very large axial compressor. We're going to be concentrating on exothermic reactors and we're going to be doing demos today. We're going to show the acceleration at high temperatures, the dynamics and tuning for clean heat transfer services uh, uh, for uh, two different methods, uh, the modified shortcut open loop tuning method we used in Deminar 6. Um, then we'll go to the more classical mod but modified ultimate oscillation closed loop tuning method. Uh, we're going to look at uh, then the dynamics for fouled heat transfer surface and we're going to then just concentrate on how it affects uh, the ultimate oscillation. We'll conclude with uh, looking at the impact of the window of allowable controller gains and show what happens if you make a major decrease in controller gain, thinking you're going to stabilize the, something and you'll see uh, what uh, uh, the problem is in terms of that actually then uh, causing um, a severe uh, divergence of your, of your temperature. There are some unstable uh, scenarios and uh, here um, if we get into a loop dead time uh, that is greater than the positive feedback time constant that we use to describe a runaway process, uh, we can get into uh, oscillations that will go from the intersection, stable intersection points here at the upper and lower end. And notice that covers a huge temperature range. And in fact, uh, uh, you may, uh, before you reach the stable, point at the high temperature range here, uh, you may in fact have tripped on uh, either a high pressure or a high temperature interlock. And so uh, when we get to this case where the heat evolution is greater than the heat removal rate, uh, we find uh, that we can reach a point of no return 
and the best thing to do uh, may be to shut down the reactor. This shows uh, the runaway response. Uh, if you put the controller in manual, and if you made a change in the controller output uh, right there, uh, and I'm using Delta CO here uh, to describe the controller output, an important thing we're, we're talking about percent because the PID works in percent. Um, there is a delay where we don't uh, see any response, and uh, then uh, after uh, this delay time, we start to see a response. Uh, right here, and uh, the time it takes to reach uh, now positive feedback is different than negative feedback, and you can imagine positive feedback is undesirable, and the definition of positive feedback is when does it reach uh, 1.72 times um, the uh, control variable response based on the process gain. Kind of a tricky thing to estimate, and in reality, for safety reasons, um, we would uh, we would not uh, allow the open loop response uh, to uh, probably even reach uh, the positive feedback time constant point of measurement because uh, once it gets into acceleration here, uh, we get into a potentially uh, dangerous situation in terms of being able to stop uh, the rising temperature. Uh, so a lot of what you would see uh, is based on tests that are done. Uh, in the initial part of the response, uh, say right here, and at that point it kind of looks like an integrator before it starts to accelerate. Uh, the process gain here can be calculated, um, but uh, like I say, it's kind of difficult to measurement online, and since uh, you don't want to keep a controller in a manual for very long on a runaway process, so this whole concept here uh, is uh, maybe more uh, theoretical to, to show you what's going on. The, the way we're going to do some tuning is we are going to focus on uh, just uh, this initial excursion here and uh, getting an idea of some tuning settings from that. And in fact, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to modify those uh, tuning settings we got out of Demon R6 that was for maximum load rejection. And uh, there are some uh, significant modifications, particularly for the reset time. So we're going to take uh, the controller gain uh, that we had uh, for uh, Demon R6, and we're going to increase it by about 25%. Uh, more significantly, we're going to take that uh, reset time, and we're going to increase it by a factor of 10. Runaway processes are very sensitive to uh, reset time, and um, you have to be um, very careful that you don't have too much integral action in there. And one of the most common problems is that the reset times are are too small in the tuning for these control systems. You should also increase uh, the derivative time. Uh, you should make sure, first of all, you have derivative action to help uh, compensate for those thermal lags. Uh, and you should make sure you have plenty of it. Uh, in this case here, we're saying uh, you should double what you would normally have uh, for uh, a runaway uh, to help deal with our acceleration that occurs in a runaway process. So um, we're going to go and do a demo here uh, to show the acceleration. Um, we're first going to um, get the controller set up so it, it will uh, be stable. So we're going to increase the reset time right off the bat. Uh, we're going to set the primary process gain, getting it ready for a runaway response because um, basically uh, in order for us to keep on scale, the minimum process gain is, is 2.2, and that happens automatically when you switch to a, a runaway. So we're going to get a jump on that by setting it ahead of time. Uh, then we're going to get set up in manual uh, where we're going to be starting at with the controller output at 25% times 2.2 will give us a PV of 55%, so we're going to set up for that. We're going to momentarily set the process lag uh, 
primary process lag to one second uh, to very quickly line out the process at the set point. Uh, then we're going to set the process uh, dead time to eight seconds, or we're going to then increase the primary process lag to 100 seconds because runaway processes better be slow, actually much slower than we're going to set because otherwise you have no chance. It will just, uh, it'll just run away from you. It will accelerate and you will be able to catch up with it. Uh, once we get that set up, then we can change the primary process type to runaway. Uh, we are going to do an open loop test here, so we're going to manually change the controller output uh, from 25 to 35%. But we're going to measure the uh, dead time and initial rate of change. Uh, we're going to note the acceleration. Uh, then we're going to stabilize the process at 55% by momentarily going back to self-regulating with the one second primary time constant and the manual output at 25%. And once we have stabilized, uh, then we will uh, put the uh, controller in, in auto and uh, go on from there. So let's uh, start that uh, demo. So you go to our lab website, and this is the screen you should see right away. And uh, we're going to go with a single loop lab. And uh, first thing we're going to do is uh, click on the faceplate and bring up the detail display. And we're going to increase the reset time here to a thousand seconds. So we can uh, make sure we don't have a reset problem right off the bat. Uh, then we're going to go to the primary process. And uh, first of all, we're going to uh, set the process gain to 2.2. Uh, and we're going to put the controller in manual, and we're going to put its output at 25%. Uh, we know we're going to probably then end up uh, at 55%. Uh, we then go in and momentarily set the process lag to uh, one second so that we line out very quickly. Then we'll go ahead and uh, we'll set the process uh, dead time to eight seconds. Now that we're uh, lined out, uh, we're going to go ahead and get ready for the runaway. And uh, we'll uh, set the primary process time constant to 100. Okay. Well, I think we're all set to make the dramatic transition to runaway. Uh, you got to be pretty well lined out because runaways uh, can diverge from set point very quickly. So we're going to uh, go to runaway. And then we are going to make a change in output to see the open loop response here. And we have the luxury of virtual plant to actually uh, see the acceleration. This would be too dangerous to do in a real plant. So one of the advantages uh, of the virtual plant is you can try these things uh, and uh, experiment to your heart's content, see what's going on without getting into trouble. You can't really hurt the software. We do have a restore button. If something gets really messed up in the software through the conditions or scenarios. So here we are, and uh, we're going to kind of maybe even zoom in a little bit more. Whoops, and lost some continuity there. Okay, so I will uh, put these in bold so we see better what's going on. Uh, we made an output change uh, right here, and uh, you know it's doing some interpolation, and so it's kind of hard to pick it up maybe exactly, but maybe it's in about uh, 19 seconds or so, and then uh, we're starting to see the change here, 
Uh, gee, just about uh, 10 or 11 seconds uh, later. So our dead time is about 10 or 11 seconds. Notice here uh, it starts out and gosh, it uh, looks like it's just ramping, uh, but then you notice, wow, we are getting into acceleration. Well, let's look at the two, two dead times uh, further uh, into the response. And so we're starting out here uh, with the response, uh, it would be nice to capture, you know, very close to that. So we'll say it starts out at, at about 55.12. Uh, um, and uh, let's go then to about uh, 49 seconds, two dead times into the future, and see how much of a change we got. Uh, <laughs> it's a moving target here, sorry. Okay, well that's kind of close enough and it's it's moved about, uh, um, let's see, about uh, four point, uh, well if, if I got it just about right since it's starting to accelerate, it's, it's moved about um, <clears throat> four point uh, uh, seven percent in, the, in the 20 seconds. Uh, notice now we, we've gotten to, into acceleration, and um, we're actually changing here at about uh, uh, at a rate, a much faster rate here uh, of maybe twice what we are down here, and we're off scale. And so we don't want to stay off scale. We've noted the acceleration. So let's go back and stabilize the process uh, again so we can get ready to do some tuning. And uh, we will do that by uh, momentarily then uh, switching back to self-regulating. And uh, I'm going to uh, put the controller, leave it in manual, go to self-regulating. <clears throat> and uh, then I'm going to put in a primary process time constant one second. <clears throat> Still have a set point of 55%, and now I'm just uh, after it gets through the dead time, it should uh, start to approach uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, the oh, and that was if I had a uh, output of 25%. <laughs> I want to get back to the 55% set point. So we're waiting through here through the dead time, and uh, then we'll start to move, and we'll move rather quickly back to 55%. Uh, okay, so we're there. Now we need to go back and get ready for runaway by using a much larger process time constant. Switch to run away. And then we can uh, put this thing in auto. And we can uh, go on to back to the uh, seminar slides and then take a look at what the tuning should be. Okay, well, <clears throat> these were the dynamics that we entered into the single loop lag, uh, primary process time con 100 seconds. So the, the total dead time was a combination of the primary and secondary process, and then uh, it also included some uh, module uh, dead time process. Gain was 2.2. Uh, and then the secondary process time constant was two seconds. If we go through about what we saw here is a 4.8% change in uh, 20 seconds, uh, and uh, it was for a 10% change in controller output. And we crank through this uh, equation here from Deminar 6 
for the near integrator, uh, we end up uh, with uh, this um, near integrator gain of uh, 0.022, and that's in units of uh, percent per second per percent. Uh, if we then go to our uh, modified equations for the near integrator where we've included that factor and we put the, this in the denominator, we end up with a controller gain of 2.8. Um, now, our dead time was around 10 seconds, um, and so if we uh, go ahead and multiply that through, including this uh, modifier here for runaway processes, we end up with a reset time of 400. Our uh, secondary lag up here, um, and the secondary process was two seconds, and so if we go ahead and, and run that through the calculation here, uh, we end up uh, with uh, two times two, or just uh, four seconds. So uh, let's uh, go ahead and put those tuning settings into the demo. Uh, we'll make a set point change from uh, 55 to 60 percent. And then uh, to get these ultimate oscillations, uh, we're going to take reset and rate out of the picture, and we're going to increase uh, the controller gain to the point uh, pretty close to the ultimate gain to cause these uh, oscillations. So let's uh, put uh, 2.8 for uh, the gain. And for the reset time, we can go with 400. And the rate time, we can go with 4. Now we're, uh, we're going to make a set point change uh, from 55 to 60%. <clears throat> and uh, we'll see how we do here. Now, it's a difficult process to control and particularly difficult to prevent overshoot, as you can imagine. Also, the controller output needs to get back to its starting point. Um, that's a feature of uh, integrating and runway processes. If there are no disturbances during the set point change, it momentarily has to drive the process, but then get back to a resting value that is pretty close to the initial controller output. And that was the basis of the uh, smart bang-bang uh, control or full throttle response, set point response uh, that we, uh, we came up with and showed in uh, Deminar number seven a couple weeks ago. Notice here we, uh, we've kind of settled out that so we're certainly not oscillating very much. Uh, there is a little bit of overshoot and uh, reset is uh, going to very gradually try and work that off. Um, but meanwhile, let's see if we can um, create some oscillations here. And we'll do that first, ultimate oscillation. First of all, we will take reset out of the picture by increasing the reset time dramatically. Uh, we'll take rate out of the picture. Uh, and now let's uh, increase the gain so we can get these ultimate oscillations. Now, you probably don't want to do this again in your plant because it can be uh, pretty darn exciting as we see here, and you may want to approach uh, oscillate an oscillation, but not really achieve an ultimate oscillation. And uh, while that's uh, developing, well, we can maybe have a little sneak peek here, and uh, it hasn't started yet. Uh, while that's developing, we can go back uh, to our web seminar. <coughs> Okay, um, I'm going to go through this frequency response pretty quick. It's, a, it's one of the few times in my career that I've uh, used frequency response, and it was to develop a better understanding and actually some equations uh, for the ultimate gain, ultimate period uh, for uh, the three major types of processes, self-regulating, integrating, and runaway. And I did this about 30 years ago uh, using Bode plots and even Nyquist plots because when you get into integrating and runaway processes, you really need to make the transition of Nyquist plots to see what's going on. 
Uh, don't ask me to show those you, to you today, and you probably don't even want to see some of these details, so I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. Uh, I, I use this in teaching uh, process control of chemical engineers because you have to show them frequency response, and, and it does provide you with an understanding of where these equations came from that I developed. Uh, so here we're looking at what if we had a sinusoidal input to a process. We would get a sinusoidal output, a B. Uh, it would be uh, hopefully attenuated by the control system, so the amplitude B would be less. Um, and there would be a phase shift um, uh, associated with it, and that's what I've got shown here. And there, there would be an oscillation period that's important for the frequency response. Uh, you can calculate the amplitude ratio from um, Bode plots, and uh, that's just an equation. If you did take a control theory course, you probably have very deep back in your mind somewhere, and you can uh, go to, uh, and then get the corresponding time shift. Uh, I work uh, in the time domain, but uh, again, um, knowing the origin of a lot of the principles is, uh, is possible by using what we learned in control theory classes. Uh, one of the key things is the amplitude ratios are multiplicative, and the phase shifts are additive. And this is actually the basis of uh, first order approximation that we use when we are working in uh, the, the time frame uh, that we see on the, on the trend charts. Uh, our trend charts are naturally plotted versus time, and we don't see the frequency responses there, although some tuning packages may do that for you. Uh, what is the ultimate period in gain? Well, that is when we have a nearly equal amplitude oscillations, and the gain that causes that is the ultimate gain. The period of those oscillations is the ultimate period. Uh, we can calculate the ultimate gain from the amplitude ratio and the process gain. And uh, the ultimate uh, period is uh, based on the natural frequency, which occurs at uh, the minus 180 degree phase shift. Now, <clears throat> what I did for runaway was extend it. Even though uh, Bode plots are not really suitable for uh, positive feedback, I extended it, and that actually does work out. And you can even simplify it. We're not going to crank through this equation today, but um, <clears throat> it is here. It's in my original book. <clears throat> it was published about 20 oh, six years ago. And so uh, you can look at it there. Or there was a blog about this. Um, I guess, uh, uh, earlier this year. <clears throat> we are going to look at the ultimate period, though. And here I did curve fits uh, for the ultimate period for the major types of processes. And, uh, of course, the most common process is self-regulating. Uh, and then we get into typically the more difficult processes, like integrating, because it's ramping away from you. <clears throat> and finally, we get into the runaway, where it's accelerating away from you and its deviation. What's interesting is that if we have no secondary lags and if the uh, dead time is not very large, all of these uh, equations will predict that the ultimate period is basically four times the dead time. And so they're consistent. And that's noted as we go through here. Uh, for example, <clears throat> If uh, the dead time is uh, much larger than the uh, secondary process lag, we simplified the near integrating process, which is up here and is four times the dead time. Um, and that was the subject of uh, Deminer number six. Uh, then if we get into the uh, runaway process, if our process feedback time constant is very large, which uh, hopefully it is by design, uh, so it slows down the acceleration, uh, we can uh, actually simplify our analysis, and the ultimate period becomes very close to what it would be uh, for the integrating process. But there is a rather complicated equation here that I came up with. Uh, the most notable thing is here, if you look at the denominator here of this expression raised to the 0 0.65 power, notice that uh, there are some uh, striking things that can happen here. We can get a zero in that denominator, or something close to a zero, as the secondary process time constant approaches the positive feedback time constant, or as the process dead time, total dead time, approaches the positive feedback time constant. Either one of those occur, uh, we're, we're in a disastrous situation. Uh, 
This is, the clue is the denominator is zero, the ultimate period approaches infinity, and we're, we're basically out of control. So uh, let's go through uh, uh, what the tuning settings would be if you're going to use the classic uh, Ziegler-Nichols uh, method. And we do have some uh, modifications here. <clears throat> First of all, we're not using uh, the Ziegler-Nichols uh, term. Like the shortcut method, we're taking about half of that. Uh, but then with mod the modification for uh, runaway is to increase it by 25%. Uh, similarly, uh, for uh, the reset time, we are taking um, uh, about uh, tw twice uh, what the, the Ziegler-Nichols uh, came up with, and, and we do that for near integrating processes. And uh, we then multiply it by a factor of 10, and so for the modification for runaway, so we end up with uh, you know this like 20 times what Ziegler-Nichols would have uh, predicted. Uh, for uh, the derivative time, amazingly enough, uh, we can use the Ziegler-Nichols. Uh, oh, and this should say rate time. And <laughs> this here should be rate time. So sorry about that. Uh, anyway, uh, there's another uh, very important thing about runaway processes. Uh, there is a window of allowable controller gains. Uh, the controller gain here must be greater than the inverse of the process gain. So let's see, our process gain is about 2.2. We got to have a controller gain uh, that's maybe you know greater than 0.4 something. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to diverge from us, run away from us. We don't have enough muscle in the controller to prevent it from uh, accelerating away from us. Uh, then, like in all loops, there is an ultimate gain, and uh, we can get into oscillations uh, that um, are nearly equal and will grow in time if we become greater than the ultimate gain. So we have this uh, gain window, and what happens as we increase uh, the dead time or the secondary process time constant, that denominator back there, you know, uh, for the ultimate period showed us uh, it starts to go to zero. What's happening here is the ultimate gain is uh, decreasing and approaches the minimum gain, and the window closes on you, and there's no acceptable tuning settings to keep you out of trouble. Uh, important thing to note is manual uh, tuning methods pose a safety risk, so um, damped uh, rather than large equal amplitude oscillations are used. In other words, we would never go for that full equal amplitude oscillation unless you are much uh, more careful about it uh, than normally, and you can keep those oscillations from growing too fast. Anyway, um, what's preferred is um, if you have an auto-adaptive tuner uh, that will keep you in closed loop control, keep you out of trouble, and it turns out the relay method auto tuner will automatically compute the ultimate period and ultimate gain uh, for you and does that by creating very small oscillations uh, around the set point and uh, you never really uh, get far away from set point because it's actually doing bang bang control interesting enough in other words it, it deviates so much from control set point it then bangs it in the other direction and, and that's the heart of the relay method is really a uh, bang bang control. Uh, so let's go on to the next uh, demo and uh, we're going to measure the ultimate period uh, and uh, note the ultimate gain and then we're going to compute the tuning settings by factoring uh, the ultimate period and ultimate gain per the modifications uh, we realize we need for uh, one array processes. So we go back uh, to our desktop here demo. And wow, we do have an oscillation. And oh boy, look, it's growing. So I'm a little bit higher uh, here uh, than I need to be. Um, in other words, the ultimate gain is uh, a little bit lower than seven. It's growing so slowly, uh, actually, uh, it's maybe not that far off. But you can see the problem here of doing this test uh, in terms of it getting out of hand by the oscillations growing. So I'm going to uh, measure this period here and uh, see about uh, what it is. Um, let's bring this up so we can see the time. So that's about um, maybe 44 seconds there. And then if we go forward here, 44 seconds. So um, we're, uh, we're ending up uh, with... Uh, 
gosh, uh, an ultimate period uh, that um, is 40 plus, uh, gee, it's a little larger than I expected, but let's see what it is back here. Uh, 15. So it's about 40, about 40 seconds here before it's starting to grow. We're, we're getting into trouble here, so uh, let's. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead and uh, and, and stabilize this thing. Well, we're, actually, we're, uh, we'll have to do that to uh, prevent it from just uh, running away from us here. So let's put the packet controller gain at 2.8, uh, 400, 4. Oops, I didn't get the take the control again. Let me go back here. Okay. Uh, we will momentarily here put this thing in manual. And uh, we're going to stabilize it by bringing it back uh, with self-regulating process. Another luxury of the virtual plant. Uh, yeah, of course, you can't switch your real process to self-regulating, but uh, here, here we go. Okay. So we're pretty close. We can go back to slow time constant here. And we can switch uh, to runaway. And uh, go to auto. Oh, okay. All right. So we got kind of an idea of the ultimate period, and uh, let's go back uh, to uh, a web seminar. Okay, well. If we factor out the the ultimate gain here, we, interesting enough, we, we come out with about the same uh, controller tuning setting here. Um, and uh, the, the period was between like 45 and 55 seconds there. So uh, we t if we take, say, 50 seconds here, we end up with an interval time of uh, about 500 seconds. Um, and if, uh, if we note that uh, or use that same ultimate period here and, uh, and actually we're multiplying it here by 1 0.125, uh, then we end up with uh, about six seconds, a little bit more rate action uh, than what we had from the shortcut tuning method. But these settings are uh, well within uh, what uh, we uh, uh, would be satisfied with as, as doing a pretty good job. Um, and here is uh, the the uh, open loop uh, di well the open loop response can really be uh, seen from the first first order approximation. And the only thing I want to say here is that the key thing is summing up the dead times uh, because uh, they, they they are so important for performance. It's the main limitation, and you do that in the first order approximation, and it goes all the way back to the phase shifts and frequency response. And you do that by summing up all the pure 
delays uh, in, in the loop as you go around the loop. And then and you add all the small uh, process time constants or, or lags in the loop. Uh, they could be in the process. They could be in the measurement. They could be in the valve. They could be in the control system. And if these are uh, much less uh, than the, and hopefully they are, than a major primary process time constant here, uh, then uh, they essentially become uh, on dead time if you want to go with the first order approximation. And remember, um, like we said, from the amplitude ratios where you got to multiply all the amplitude ratios, uh, here we're multiplying all the uh, process gains to get the total gain and make sure that what we end up with is uh, uh, always in terms of percent. Uh, for self-regulating, it's percent per percent or dimensionless. For integrating, it's uh, percent per second per percent, and uh, because the PID works in percent, an important thing. Here's the nomenclature. Okay, so now we're going to move on uh, to the next uh, uh, demo, and we're going to see the effect of uh, going with a foul heat transfer surface, and we're going to do that by just increasing the secondary process lag here from 2 to 20 seconds, and then we're going to see uh, uh, what happens to the ultimate oscillation uh, period. Uh, again, we're going to take the reset rate out of there, and we're going to go with what we think is a good ultimate uh, gain of about 4. And notice that it has uh, decreased, and the window of allowable controller gains is, uh, is decreasing. So uh, let's go to our content and uh, desktop demo. <clears throat> oh, wow. Hey, those settings, tuning settings are still working. Um, we're we're going to really kind of mess that up, though, here by adding uh, this fouled heat transfer surface. And we can do that by increasing the secondary process lag uh, by uh, 20 seconds to 20 seconds. Uh, now uh, we're going to try and create an ultimate oscillation. We're going to take reset out of the picture. Take rate out of the picture. I'm going to change this to four. And uh, gosh, we're so close to set point. It may take uh, quite a while for it here. So maybe I should make a very tiny increase in set point. And uh, we'll give that a chance uh, to develop here, uh, see uh, how it does uh, in terms of uh, creating an ultimate oscillation here. And uh, it's, it's uh, a result of us increasing a uh, secondary lag from 2 to 20 seconds. Okay, if we crank through this equation here now with this big secondary lag, uh, we would uh, come up with an estimate that our ultimate period is going to increase to about 115 seconds. <clears throat> and, uh, well, it's probably a little bit soon for us to see that, so we'll go back here and, and talk about this a little bit uh, as you can see, the denominator is uh, getting uh, smaller here dramatically as a result of uh, us uh, having uh, just introduced uh, at this point uh, a 20 second uh, secondary process lag instead of uh, two seconds. And uh, as a result here, this expression here is, um, um, is essentially uh, going to come out as uh, after we raise it to 0.65 power to 2.2. Uh, so we're going to add 2.2 to the 1 uh, and multiply it by 4. Uh, and we're going to end up uh, with uh, 115 seconds. And now if we, if we had a zero secondary process lag here, the numerator would have been zero. 
we would have then ended up with zero for here, and we would be just left with the one here, and so four times the dead time would have been the ultimate period. So this uh, equation shows the dramatic impact of this uh, secondary uh, process lab. So um, let's uh, let's go back uh, to the demo and see what, what's happening with the oscillation. Well, it's uh, well we can see it in the controller output uh, better than we can in the measurement because it's so close, um, but uh, it is bigger. Uh, the ultimate period is larger, and uh, if we wait just a little bit longer. I think we'll have a, a nice full cycle here um, to to trigger off. Let's see. And so here we are about 30 seconds into it, uh, maybe for the first valley here. And let's see where we get the next valley. <clears throat> well, yeah, that's, that's uh, just a short of 100. 20, so it's about 110 seconds or so. So uh, our, our estimate there is pretty darn good considering everything uh, going on here. And we, we end up with an ultimate period of about 110 uh, seconds. Um, before we leave here, uh, well, let's see. Well, I'll do this official and we'll go back, but see what... Uh, supposed to be saying here. Uh, well, what we're going to do here is, uh, well, we measure the ultimate period and ultimate gain, okay. And uh, we, if we calculate it out, uh, this says, uh, what are the new settings that we should be using for these fouled surfaces? Uh, notice uh, we got 1.6, uh, we have to reduce the controller gain, we got to increase uh, the integral time, and uh, we need to increase the derivative action. And the shortcut tuning method probably would have come up with a, a better estimate of that rate. And really, the rate uh, should have been probably um, more than twice that. And that would have come up from um, the shortcut method. Uh, this is a little, we really need to compensate for those foul heat transfer surfaces. So. Um, I would have been uh, looking for twice the uh, secondary time constant, or about uh, more like 40 seconds from the shortcut tuning method. Anyway, <clears throat> let's uh, complete the demos here by decreasing uh, the controller gain so we're below the low gain window, and see what kind of trouble we can uh, get into there. Okay. And, well, we'll enter in uh, some of those settings. Well, just to show that, hey, all we're really screwing up here is a uh, low gain window. And uh, I'll put in uh, the settings here from the ultimate oscillation. I think this was rare. maybe uh, one, one. Five zero, yeah, 1,050. Now we're going to see what happens if, hey, we think we're, on, we're getting a little overshoot, a little bit of oscillation. Hey, what do we do? Let's decrease the controller gain. So we say, well, let's make sure we don't oscillate. Let's uh, decrease the controller gain, uh, you know, so we're sure we're not going to oscillate, right? So we decrease it to 0 0.02. Unfortunately, that's below uh, the lower gain limit. And uh, we're, we're, we're going to get in trouble here in, in a while. And uh, it may take a while for it to uh, develop uh, since we're pretty close to set point. But uh, we'll, we'll see that. Uh, but um, while that's developing, let's go back to the seminar and wrap up. Going to help it along here. I'm 
maybe is that switch back. Um, I'm just thinking um, that maybe I need to help this along, so I'm just going to change the set point here. Okay, well, we're going to wrap up here, uh, and uh, we're going to be using the Process Control Lab at Emerson Exchange, and we're going to be doing uh, some 10-minute uh, clips uh, using Camtasia, showing you some, uh, some ways of doing process control improvement, and we're going to be promoting the website more, uh, and hopefully people will take the time to... Uh, Try it out. It's free. It's a state-of-the-art virtual plant. Uh, it allows you to do independent interactive study. I think you can learn in 10 minutes uh, what might take 10 years, uh, but you, you really are kind of limited, in, particularly in a real plant, to what you're allowed to do in terms of experimentation. Um, you have online performance metrics, both for the loop and the process. We have standard operator graphics and historian. Uh, we have a control room type environment as a result. Uh, we're really not into the DCS configuration. Uh, we're really at the operator level. Uh, you don't need any modeling expertise, uh, no configuration expertise. Uh, we have rapid risk-free plant experimentation. You can abuse the plant uh, however much you want into trying out your ideas. Uh, we think that can promote a deeper understanding of concepts and uh, provide process control improvement demos to help uh, convince uh, management of uh, your idea. And uh, there are sample lessons uh, available through their recorded seminars, uh, and they're uh, noted here on the welcoming page. All right. Thanks, Greg. Greg what uh would like everyone to do is just take a moment to, at the end of this, to give us your feedback on today's session. And if you'd go to this would you recommend us slash with that URL, it's basically a one question survey plus a comment associated with it just to rate it. And your comments are important. Help us to improve these. Okay, and our next seminar is going to be September 8th, same time, so that's 10 a.m. Central here in the U.S. or 1500 UTC time, and Greg's going to be doing a control loop performance primer, the what and why needed to improve 90% of the loops, so that's one you don't want to miss. Also, we've been recording today's session, and we'll have it available. So if you have any colleagues you think that might would benefit from it, there'll be links on both Greg's modelingandcontrol.com site as well as my emersonprocessexperts.com blog. Okay, and with that, let me open up the floor for any questions. I'll be monitoring the Q&A box, and we'll give it about a minute of quiet time here. I'll be looking for your questions to come in, and we'll see what we can do to tackle them. So fire away. You know, I've uh, been in a control room with some exothermic reactors, and, and some of the more interesting processes are, have highly reactive chemicals, and that's what we want from a chemistry standpoint. Um, uh, some of these highly reactive chemicals are like hydrogen cyanide and proline, and uh, they're, they're doing a polymerization with a very rapid heat release that can uh, get out of hand. Uh, and uh, Besides being dangerous, so they can very quickly get into a high temperature situation. I've been in a, an ABS polymerization plant a batch reactor where uh, they said, well, there's nothing we can do. It's going to blow. Uh, fortunately, they got a good 
uh, flare st uh, catch tank and flare stack system, and, uh, and so the whole uh, reactor would blow over, t and uh, and they would just uh, you know start a new batch after uh, they flared off uh, and got things. Uh, maybe they tried to figure out what was going on, uh, but you get into those situations, uh, points of no return, and um, pretty pretty darn exciting. Uh, I'm going to go back while we're waiting here. Yeah, there was a uh, okay. private message I got. Someone would like to actually see that process control lab site. Do you think you could share your desktop and get sure. a browser to yeah. see? Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's do that, and uh, we'll uh, go back to uh, my desktop. Uh, first of all, this is the excursion that's going on right now with the low control again, and it will go off scale if we uh, wait long enough. Uh, here, uh, if you go to modeling control, I forgot to mention, uh, and you go to application note uh, 4, uh, you'll find uh, the equations here for positive feedback and how for reactions uh, you can get into that uh, situation. And uh, we can go to uh, modeling and control, <laughs> and I'll just do that by opening up another, because uh, that's my default. Uh, no, I've got a modeling control. We want to go to process control lab. Sorry. <clears throat> All right. So when you come into the process uh, control lab, this is the welcoming page. Uh, we, we've added some stuff um, based on Demonar 7 that's only really partially there for uh, Loop Lab 1, and we're in the process of this week of making it available for uh, the other control loop lags in terms of the uh, set point feed for the smart bang bang. And, the set point metrics, and then we're going to add evaporator control in uh, September. Uh, you uh, get access by doing a request access here and filling out information, um, agreeing to the terms of the use, which basically means you aren't going to try and commercialize this plant, uh, the, the, uh, or try and get the model here and use it for other reasons other than your own learning experience. Um, so you do that, uh, and, and it will send you an email with um, uh, the way of accessing this through remote desktop. We actually have about 10 virtual plants. We're only uh, setting up for two right now, because those are the ones we're updating. And it turns out the remote desktop IP address of these first two are the ones that are most frequently available through um, I, uh, your IT departments. And so the other IP addresses for the other virtual plants probably more useful for conducting uh, courses. Um, and um, if you uh, go to the overview, there is uh, some screen prints showing you, uh, giving you some guidance as to how you would interact uh, with uh, uh, with it, and I guess it, uh, sometimes it can be a little bit slow coming up. Oh, there we go. Uh, so this shows the main screen and, uh, uh, and the restore button. If you get a way out in terms of conditions and just want to go back to the initial state you had as you entered the lab, you can click on that button, and uh, it shows you the explains uh, some of the things that you can do here with the labs and uh, provides uh, a little bit of guidance there. Uh, the temperature loop lab was actually uh, based on the University of Texas Unit Operations Lab, and uh, the pH lab was uh, based on a Monsanto installation as uh, documented in a chemical processing article, and the link is there. And that shows uh, the trend charts, uh, shows how you can change modes, uh, gives you some of the detailed displays here. Uh, we haven't updated this one to show bang bang control. Um, do that this week. And it's a smart bang bang. Uh, uh, it's not the bang bang in your thermostat, but it's a smart bang bang that knows where on the second bang where it should end up with uh, ideally 
for you to be right at set point. Uh, and then turns it over close with control. That was the subject of last week's seminar, or last seminar two weeks ago, seminar number seven. And so this just goes through the screens here and shows how it also to use some of the tools. All right. Well, that was a nice uh, tour through there. I'm looking at the clock. We're a few minutes over, and I haven't seen any questions come in, so I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and we'll get the recorded version out here a little later today. So thanks for visiting, and we'll see you September 28th. This is pretty impressive at this point. <laughs>